We don't play with this thing, amen, but, you know, they went on, they told other stories of the bricks, you know, I always wonder how they got that color brick, you know, because it was a different color, and he went and told us about how they went, and they was asking for the price of the brick, and the guy said, look, I got all these bricks over here I can't use because somebody refused them, amen, there's nothing wrong with them, but they didn't like, particularly like the color, amen, and they took those bricks, and those bricks are the bricks that's on that church right now. You know, those are premium bricks now where we all right, where they whitewashed and that kind of thing. But back then, that wasn't the end thing. And then they told the story of, he asked the Hispanic dude that he knew on his job and said, well, would you come over and give me one day's work just to help me out and get a couple of your friends? He said he showed up the next day with 18 Hispanic brothers who went out there and laid brick for free. Oh, come on, somebody. And then they said he went back to the job and talked so much junk to the black guys. said they came back the next week and there were 22 black guys there. And they lay brick for free, amen. So all the bricks that you saw in that church, and many of you have been there, they say they were all laid um, based on free labor, amen. They just kept going on and on about the story. So what that gives me to, to understand and see, you know, sometimes we get discouraged and we see things and things don't work out exactly the way we thought they were going to work out. We had a plan laid out, and the Bible t- tells us that we should plan, amen. But even in our plans, God has a way to turn our plans. Did I see my life the way and I see it? Is? I mean, it is right now. I'll tell you absolutely no. I didn't. I didn't think I'd be a pastor. Amen. I didn't think I'd be doing some of the things that I'm doing. But God has a way that he would t- take us. And we said, Lord, take our life. We said, our life is not our own. Amen. But it belongs to him. And I'm just so grateful. So I came back inspired. I came back stronger in faith. Amen. To hear that God is still working. And God is in the still in the healing business, amen. I'm just so grateful to see each and every one of you here on this morning. You could have chosen to be somewhere else, but you chose to be here with us. And for that, we are grateful. I apologize for the, the little heat that's in here. It's a little bit better than it was, but I think they only come like right in the morning and then try to flip it on this building. It's so big. I don't know if it's going to get cool in that time. And of course, you see we have a different setup, but I think this might be better, amen. So we're, you know, we're not tweaking. We just give the, we just use what they're giving, um, giving us. And I ask that you all be in prayer with me because we're in a new situation here in this particular building, and that they have new leadership. And so, you know, we were trying to be strategic. We got a contract to run us for a while, and so we did that. But after that, you know, we do have to have those conversations, and that they look favorably upon us. And if not, then God has somewhere else for us to go. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're just so grateful. Um, um, we ask that you all continue to pray for Sister Francis and her husband. They got the double whammy. They got the COVID and the flu. And um, I think they're at the end of that. Amen. But we ask that you continue to pray for them uh, as well as so many others that have been fighting illness and sickness. Be careful. You know, it's that time of the year where things are starting to pick up a little bit as the um, sun sets a little earlier and the air gets a little cooler. You know, some are allergies, some are all kinds of things. So ask that you continue to just be mindful and, and prayerful and, and take care of yourselves. How many of you are happy to be here in Jesus? Amen. I know that the alternative is that you're not here, amen. So I don't know about you, but I am happy to be here. Do we have any birthdays that we need to celebrate today? Amen. I went down yesterday also. You know, I got the double, and that was my mother's birthday. So we celebrated seventy with her on yesterday. I think mama just cried and cried and cried. All the children were there, and everybody's healthy, and everybody's good. And I guess my mom is just at the age where everything is still in the middle of her right now. <laughs> but I'm just grateful to have my mother, amen, that I have a mother that's still alive, amen. There's so many that I talk to who parents are no longer here or not healthy, amen. And we're just grateful, amen, to God and for keeping them. Grateful to God for my um, wife, Alicia, amen, and all that she does. And I, my mother-in-law who lives there in the home with us and our children. Madison and Preston, amen, as they continue to grow and go forward in the Lord. And as well as many of you, amen, all your children. Uh, we are the Safe House Church here in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm not going to be before you long. I don't think I saw any birthdays pop up, and I don't think we have any anniversaries. Did I, did I miss somebody? Um, oh, okay. Happy birthday. Sister Samaya celebrated birthday. I know she's not going to tell us which number. 22 again. <laughs> 51 that's something to celebrate God for so many 
um, that doesn't meet that age, amen. And we're grateful for God for keeping you and allowing you to see that age. And happy birthday to you from the St. Thomas Church. Also, since the last time we was together, Sister Taylor um, lost her father-in-law. That's the um, brother Jerry's father. Uh, we have talked with them and talked with them extensively. And we did send something here from the church financially to support them and to show them that we, uh, we love them and that we're there with them. Um, his father had been sick for some time. Help was going up. In fact, he was in our midst. I think when uh, their first baby was uh, Christian, so we did get the opportunity to uh, meet him. And if you see Jared and you see his father, hey, man, he's, uh, as we would say, the split in the image of his um, father. But we want you to ask that you continue to keep them in your prayers. When I talked to him, um, he was um, in pretty good spirits and, you know, um, as well as they, you know, obviously they just saw many things would go that fast, but um, things took a turn and he's no uh, longer with us, but he's in the arms of the Father. Amen. So I'm going to go right on in and believe, share with you what I believe God has given me to share with you um, today. Amen. If I can find my mouse here. Okay. Um, I ask that you open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. And we also started our new Bible study. Um, we just started, I don't think we're going to be in that book very long because we already have went through it. But we are in the book of Nehemiah. We're in the book of Nehemiah. Is this going to stretch for you, man? We're in the book of Nehemiah, and um, in the, um, we are now already into chapter, I believe it's chapter number five. Um, so we covered the first four chapters um, right away. Uh, we in the book of Nehemiah, not today, but when Bible said we in the book of Nehemiah, so we get to the point now where they're rebuilding the wall with uh, one hand with a brick, the other hand with a spear. So if you're behind, we got to get you caught up on where they are. Um, tremendous story um, of, of fight and courage and encouragement and leadership um, that we see with um, Nehemiah and the different times that he meets his enemy named Sam Ballot. Um, Sam Ballot um, is a form of the devil here who tries to stop uh, Brother Nehemiah from getting his work done. Sam Ballot, and he has a compadre named Tobiah. Uh, so Sam Ballot and Tobiah, you're here us talking about them as we continue with the book of Nehemiah, I think probably two or three weeks in. But um, this week we will not be on traveling, so we won't meet this week. All right, so we have Philipp, um, Philippians. We're on the first chapter in verse number 21. Philippians, first chapter, verse 21. And it says this. We're going to 21 through, uh, 21 through 26. It says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is to gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all, all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. If I want to use for a subject on this morning, um, we go before you on this morning. I want to use for the subject. If I can find it now. Amen. I just talked them up. They're walking in. Hallelujah. Yeah, I can't find myself. Oh, I need some comments. Stay out the middle. Stay out the middle. Let us pray. 
Oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning, and we want to say thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, just for every heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit that's here in the building. Lord, I ask you to continue to watch over and keep them, Lord God. Love on them, Lord, like on the weekend. Bless them when they're going in, they're going out. Strengthen them, Lord God. Let the word be heard on today, Lord Jesus, that changes the mind, a thought, Lord Jesus, a situation, oh God. Lord, I ask that you touch each and every person who made and pressed their way to be here on today. Let the Lord humble and come to the beginning for a fashion. Bless them some a hundred, some a thousand fold. In the beautiful name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, for we know this one thing and we know this to be true, that we walk by faith. And not by sight. I want to acknowledge your brother, um, man, Memphis, who just won't be. We just got through talking about, you know, your passing of your father. We want to offer our sincere condolences to you and your wife um, in your time of bereavement. Amen. Amen. So here this morning, we just read here, we talked about this is um, Paul. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Remember, when we read here in the Bible, these are letters, and these are letters that are written back um, to different churches and different um, organizations at the same time that he writes to them to encourage them to give them instruction on how they should carry themselves. Now, the thing is, the same thing right now is what we actually have. These are the letters that we have on record that we read these letters and we can, um, conduct ourselves and conduct our lives based on the teachings that were left in the Bible, amen. There are other teachers, there are things all over the place, but these 66 books that we focus on, and in particular this letter here that Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, that he was in a situation. Paul was in a situation that he knows Christ, and he knows Christ well, and he knows Christ to the point that he knows that to die is to gain, amen. To die is to gain, what he means by that, that he's free from this life. He's free from this struggle. He's free from his flesh. He's free from the things that happen in his body. He's free from having to take care of this and take care of that. He's free from the worries of this world. I don't know about you, but, I, but sometimes these worries in life seems like they kind of get you down. The Bible tells us that we should not worry. Why? Because he said by worrying that you would not add one cubit inch to your body. Amen. So he tells us not to worry, but if we look at a world today that you can't help but look and see that I don't know how they make it because I think about how I feel and I know who I trust and I know that Jehovah Jireh is my provider, but I look at a world today where we have presidents being shot at, amen, and whether we feel one way about them or not, amen, we see lies being told and we see all the political stuff that's going on. We see there's war on the Gaza Strip, amen, there's genocide of one, um, one race to another, amen, and, and there's so many different things going around the world. There's spy planes going on here and stuff there. We don't know if things are real anymore, amen, because they have all this stuff with AI that's getting so good that it's hard to tell the real thing from the fake, amen, but we are in a place now that the world is getting to a point that it's going to meet a tipping point. And what we mean by tipping point, that it's going to get to a point that people are just going to start to just give up, amen. And what God is telling us in all that we've done and all that we go through, that you and I are to stand. Because what happens is, at the end of the day, when the real heat comes, when things really come out, those things that are authentic are the things that make the test of time. And, you know, we used to say in the country that if you want to separate the cream from the crop, then you just got to wait a little bit, amen. If you want to separate something, you put a little heat on it, and what you'll see is the heat will start to separate things, amen. Because those things that couldn't tolerate the heat at that level, that things will what? Start to move apart. So if you wanted to get gold, amen, you take gold and what do you do? You heat it up to its boiling point and then you'll start to see all the impurities that's in the gold. And this is why the Bible tells us, he said, let the crops grow together so that when he comes that way, he would do the separating, amen. So Paul finds himself in a place that he says that I want to separate myself from this. You know, I've been through these things and I've gone through this and I've gone through that and I know who my Savior is. I know who holds my tomorrow. I know where I can go. I know he's that rock of ages. I know he's the truth and the light. I know that no other way can you go but through him. But then he finds himself in the middle of a situation, much like our Savior, Jesus Christ, because of his love for the people that are around him, for his love that his call. How many of you know that sometimes when you're in situations, that in circumstances, you look at a thing and you know that you can do this and you will be fine, but there's a call to something greater. Oh, come on, somebody. So Paul finds himself here and said that 
I can die and I can gain and I'm going to be okay is what he's saying. But in the middle of this, the Bible said that he betwixt himself, amen, in a straight. Straight meaning that he's, there's this one way, but in the betwixt meaning that he's where in the middle. And in the middle of this situation, he has to make a decision. Does he make this, this decision that he can make and go ahead and go and be with Christ? Or does he stay and remain in truth and, and in light and go through this suffering that he knows that his body's going to go through? Why? For you and I. If I'm reminded about Christ, that Christ had a decision to make. He said, not my will, but your will be done on earth as it is here in heaven. That what that, you know, that he prayed to the Father and said, if this cup don't have to come to me, then I would rather not have it, amen. But if it's your will, Lord, I have to take this. And when I take this, it's going to be for what? The remission of the sins of the world, amen. That he did this for you and I before any of us even knew who we were, amen. Before we even knew what we would do, that he had already paid the price for you and I. The price was paid over 2,000 years ago. And so now Paul finds himself here and said, what do I do when I'm in the mirror, amen? I can save myself. I don't know about you, but a lot of people in the world today will save themselves. I've found out time and time in my career, in my dealings with people, that people almost certainly almost going to always vote for themselves, amen? And sometimes you and I as believers, we find ourselves in that position where we can vote for ourselves. But the Spirit of God comes in and says, say, greater is me than is in the in greater is me, he that's in me than he that's in the world. And he reminds me that what well, I don't live this life for me. Oh, come on, somebody. And what Paul is reminding us here that in between this, that he's reminding, yes, I can go on to heaven. Yes, I can go on to be with the Lord, which is far greater than what I'm doing here. But I have a decision to make because of you, I'm going to stay. Because of you, because I, if I'm here, you're going to have a better life. Why? Because I'm going to be able to partake to you the teachings of God if you are willing to adhere, if you're willing to listen. See, so many times the answers are always typically around us, but we find ourselves that we're not in a position to listen. Oh, come on, somebody. I think about it sometimes, and, and I'm, I'm looking at As I got older, I started suffering with this stuff called arthritis, right? And I remember as a kid, the older people would tell us, oh, you better get off that ground. You're going to have arthritis all in your butt. And you got to do this. You gotta, this is how they used to talk to us when we was children, amen. And, you know, as children, you ain't thinking about it. But now in my 40s, and the doctor said, yep, that's arthritis. That's why you can't get up like that no more. And that's why that moves. And now I, I start to think back. I had sound wisdom around me the whole time. And I had somebody who was thankful enough or thoughtful enough to tell me that you may not want to do that right now because I already know a road that I'm already traveling. And I'm trying to tell you, young man, if you will listen to me, that I can help you avoid a little bit of heartache. Oh, come on, somebody. So now here I am in my mid-40s and that knee in the morning. It reminds me every morning that it's there. Amen. If I sit in the seat low enough, I understand why they say, you come over here and help me get up. I, I ain't quite there yet, but I feel it, amen. And now I understand things a little bit different. Paul said it like this. He said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So here Paul is making the adult decision that I'm not going to be staying right here in the middle because here in the middle is where nothing good happens. Here in the middle lies indecision. Here in the middle is where the lukewarm Christians are. These are the ones that I'm not in sin, but I'm really not celebrating Christ. That I'm just doing enough, enough to be in, but I'm not really out, amen. And I, I, I do this, I do a half of this part, but I don't do that part. And this is what he's talking about, that part there in the middle, amen. I'm reminded that lukewarm water is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because if it's not cold enough, then things will not be, a, if it's not cold enough, things won't die. And if the water's hot enough, things won't won't, we'll die, amen. But in the middle is where everything lives. It's in lukewarm water that you get your germs and you get your mosquitoes and you get all this nasty stuff. Why? Because the water temperature is, what they used to say, oh, go like in three baths, it was just right. And what we find ourselves is where we find ourselves to be comfortable is that position of just right. And that just right is well, right there in the middle. So when my friends see me, they don't see me as super saved, but he's just a little bit saved, amen. I don't know about a little bit saved. Either you saved or you're not saved, amen. You, you in or you out. And so this is where Paul said that we cannot be betwixt the two. We cannot be caught in the middle. There's a decision to be made. And Paul has made the decision here that what I am more nevertheless to abide in my flesh, 
I am more needful to you if I am here. Amen. And so now he makes the, the decision in confidence to what? Continue to abide here with them in joy and faith. Why? Because it's not about him, but it's about helping his brother. It's about helping his sister to lead and guide them to the next situation and to truth. And I know some of you and some of us find ourselves in situations and we wonder, God, why does this come to me, Lord? God is using you as the mediator, amen. He's using you as an intercessor on your jobs, amen, and, and in your places of work and in your homes and in your families, amen. You always wonder, my wife and I used to always wonder, say, we were always the couple that got along with everybody, amen, that we can go to these people's house and have a good time, and we can go to these people and have a good time, and we can go over here and have a good time, but then if everybody got together, it was not a good time, amen, because there was some issue somebody had with somebody, and this one had it with this one, and we kind of found ourselves in the middle of all all this stuff. And we was wondering, we said, well, well, what is going on? And, and sometimes God will use us as the intercessor between the two because sometimes it's just a minor miscommunication on a thing or two. I found myself here at work the last couple of weeks, been in that position a lot that this is going on and, and that's going on, amen. And, and people feel this way about this and people feel that way about that. And what we find at the end of the day that everybody wants the same exact thing, but they saying it two different ways, amen. So they're expressing it this way and that was expressing it that way and therefore it's causing confusion, amen. And with this confusion, the Bible said what well, that God is not the author of confusion. There is no division. There is one vision, and that vision is what? To be with Christ. And everything that we're doing and everything we're going through is what? For the redemption of our spirit back to him. All that we've set up, all this that we've done is what? To set us up to be able to walk back with him. So then Paul reminds us here that he's here and he's in between the two. And I want to remind you today that you have a decision to make, amen. That you have a decision to make whether you want to be in or you're going to be out. Amen. There's no wishy-washy. There's no going back and forth. There's no indecision. But a decision has to be made. You are now at a pivotal point in your life. Amen. God is asking you, who are you going to choose to serve? But for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. Amen. I'm not saying it's going to be easy because Paul has already told us that this life will be full of toils and things that we will go through. But what we find is that we cannot be in the middle. We cannot live on that fence. Amen. I tell people all the time, you sitting on that fence, you're going to get hurt at some point. Because some, at some point, you're going to have to pick or choose which side you're going to be on. You're going to have to make a decision of how you're going to go. And now that decision is going to guide your thoughts and it's going to guide your life and where God is going to take you and what he's going to do for you. Because what God wants to know is can he trust you? Amen. Can he trust you if he puts you in this pressure situation that you're not going to be sliding from the left, sliding to the right? Amen. Are you going to be able to be trusted that when they come after your integrity and they come in there and try you and they come in there and say things that were so cruel cool about you that you know it's not true and they know it's not true and will tell a lot of your face. I used to hear people say that all the time and I was like, well, that ain't never happened to me. Keep on living, as old people say. And you, baby, your time is coming. You will get a turn and it's so boring, so nasty that you see people lie and you know they lie, they know they lie and you sit there and tell it to you just like they tell you the truth. And what happens is sometimes we work with people that ain't got to the point in time in their life that they didn't told the lie so much that they have convinced themselves that it's the truth. And this is where we are in our world today. They have convinced themselves that this is true. They convinced themselves that if we do this and we do that and we, we go this way and we go that way, that we will be okay. Why? Because they've told themselves long enough and to the point that now it's becoming part of their spirit. And God just removed himself from them. He said, that is a reprobate mind, amen. And once you get to a reprobate mind, God will remove himself from you. So anytime you get to the point that now you don't have a conscience anymore and you don't feel things anymore and you can you go in a place and you're just making decision after decision that you know is typically against what you believe in. It's typically what you would do, amen. And we find ourselves in this place on today that we find ourselves in our park. There's election season and people are doing all kinds of things, saying all kinds of things, pulling up stuff from 25, 30 years ago. This is how people play. But I'm so glad I'm in the household of faith, amen, that my past 
is my past. I don't care what your political thing is. But what God said, when you come to the household of faith, that all old things are what? Have passed away, and now there's life, and there's life more abundantly, amen. So you see how the world operates, and as soon as they get mad with you, or as soon as they think that you, you got a favorable position over them, here they come picking up stuff from 1922 that nobody even cared about until you was in a certain situation, a certain position. My wife and I was talking the other day, we said, man, you at a point now that you can't do anything as a kid. You know, we've seen even on the athletes, amen, we're not just talking about political stuff, but we've seen even on the athletes when kids 10, 13, 14 years old, and that Twitter thing first came out, nobody really knew what they were doing. They were playing around on it. They said a couple of things. Maybe they said the N-word with a double G on it or something, and they said this and they said that, but they were children. And now people are pulling this up when they were children and holding them accountable for it as adults. This is the world that we live in now. So I often find myself with my children, amen, trying to guard what they do in the end. You want your kids to be kids because that's part of the matriculation process. That's just how you learn. I'm not going to be able to tell you don't do that, not do this, not do that. But some things you got to kind of feel for yourself. But now the way the world is set up, when they be crucified, we won't even get our daughter. By maybe one or two poor decisions they made. Because the truth of the matter is that all my poor decisions were displayed. And I'm so glad that social media was around when I was a teen because I would have been in some trouble. I know how I thought as a teenager. I know my attitude as a teenager. And I would have put some things out there. You know, I was, man, I thought I was Malcolm X. And I would have said some stuff because I was really deep and rooted into this black experience. As a teenager, I went to the Million Man March. I was in all the way in. And there's some things now that I understand as an adult. Maybe I, they were correct, but maybe I don't express them that way. And so this comes with what? Maturity. And so what Paul is saying is here, look, I got to make a decision. I got to stay because you are not reached the age of maturity. And so therefore, I'm going to sacrifice what I want to do to be able to protect you until you grow up to maturity. See, the Bible talks about growing from milk to meat. So we have the milk things of God. Then you have what they call the meat things of God. And so as a new believer, amen, when new believers come in, I can't choke them with Acts 2.38. Oh, I believe Acts 30. I'm apostolic born, apostolic bread, and someday I'll be apostolic dead. Amen. And I believe in the five baptism of Jesus Christ. But someone who just walked in the door, do I beat him up with that? I'm just saying. When you walk into the restaurant, do they go there and they just throw everything at you at one time? No, the Bible said he that wins souls is what? Is wise. So there's a way that we present the gospel. I know what the people don't want the gospel. It's the way we present it. And then when we present it, we don't have nothing behind it ourselves. You tell me God going to bless me, and you've been paying time for 20 years, and I don't see nothing. I'm just saying. So I got to a point that I used to hide stuff, and me and my wife used to have a conversation about it. When God would bless us, I said, no, baby, we've been tired since we were 14, 15 years old. We've been living for God. I thought about it the other day. I've been living for God for 35 years. And I'm still a young man. I thought about that for a minute. I said, shoot, that's a whole lifetime. I got saved when I was like 15. So now over this lifetime, people, they look at it and say, okay, you've been serving God all that time. What has changed for you? There must be some separation. And it's not just about getting things. But it's about what? That lifestyle, because they know. We was in my hometown yesterday. Like I said, we were celebrating my mom. I saw two or three people while I went to high school with there in the restaurant. They know. They ask questions. They see. I see some of them, and I look at me. I know I'm a little overweight, but I look okay. Comparison. I'm just saying. Some of them, like, they lived a couple of lives. And these are the things, what? Because God, you know, God is protecting me. As the pastor was saying on yesterday, he said that, you know, people always talk about how God got them over. He said, but I want to tell you about the God that kept me. Yes, you might have been out there and God delivered you from that hallelujah, but it's the same power that God delivered you, kept me. And so many times, we are a generation now that so many people have been talking about what they've been through, but see, I've been through some things too, but I've been inside the church. And the things that he's kept me from there too, because everybody in the church ain't about the church. Right? And so what we find here 
is that in all that we're getting, God is what? Using us as an example. So when we go through things, the Bible tells us, he said what? Don't count it all joy when you face diverse tests. Now, I won't tell that person this week. I was just kind of, I was complaining a little bit about all the stuff that kept happening. And this person said, why does this stuff keep happening to you? But then it quickened in my spirit. I was like, you know what? Because that means the blessing's on the way. Why? Because my life has to be an example to somebody else's life. If all that would have happened to me, they said, I would have probably lost my mind. But it all happened to me, and I didn't lose my mind. What's different? It happened to my kid, and I didn't lose my mind. What's different? It happened to me on my job and I didn't lose my mind. What's different? It happened to my mother and my father and I didn't lose my mind. What's different? That is the difference. And this is why Paul has now made the decision to stay. Because he has to continually show them and love on them and bless them and say, look, your life is going to be better because I'm going to be around. Why? Because you're going to be living through me. You're going to watch how God does things for me, and you're going to have faith to know that he'll do them for you. The Bible says that we are overcome by the what? The power of our testimony. And this is why, you know, it was so good, even on yesterday, to hear that testimony. Because there were so many things that I was there, but I was not privy to. There were so many things that happened. All I know is in the, I saw a building, but I didn't know all the stuff that happened in the middle. See, people see a, a happy marriage. Y'all been married 22 years, but they didn't see all this stuff that happened in the middle. They see healthy children. They see children that are grown and went to college, but they don't know what happened in the middle. Think about it. They celebrate you when the baby's born, and we celebrate you on your way out, but nobody gives a curse about the middle. And it's that middle part that we struggle with. It's that middle part where the decisions are made. That middle part is where we have to decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And as I continue to tell you all, and I'm learning and I'm growing more in Christ, is that our faith is actually a system. He said, have faith meaning that what? Do you use the system? Every time I make a decision, does it line up with my faith? It's a system. Somebody said, what is your faith? They want to know what is your system of beliefs. Because if this is your faith, they say if your faith is Christianity, then your decision making should be what? Lined up like this. Right? That's what they say. Now here's the, the crux of the matter is, is when we get down to it, you can have faith all you want, but if it's not applied, what does it mean? See, we, in, especially in America, we are very guilty of this. We try to legislate spirituality things. We try to put laws in place for spirituality things. Case in point, probably very controversial, abortion. I believe that a child, if God allows that baby to be conceived, should be here. I do. Because I know the chances of that child being here it's very, very little. So if they are going to be here, they're meant to be here. You ever seen the signs of it? It's like a billion to one. You have a better chance of winning the lottery nine or six times than winning that. But everybody in here won that lottery. No matter what shape you in, you won that lottery. You are a winner. All that you had to go through, all that defenses your mom's body had, all the timing that was in play and all that, oh, it's, it's definitely ones and billions. But how about this? We serve a God of what? Free choice. He lets you choose what you want to do. He doesn't force you to do anything. Because he wants us to love him what? Freely. So you can make a law, and I'm not for or against I'm going to be very clear about that. But you can make a law that says, you don't do this. If they don't change the people's hearts, they're going to find a way to do it anyway. They made a law. I remember when I was coming to high school, you cannot drink alcohol until you were 21. I promise you, on Senior Skip Day in Henderson, North Carolina, we found a way to make that happen. We were all under 18. Do you see, you see what I'm saying? It's about the heart. That we cannot legislate. That's a 
spirit thing. Why do you rob, kill, and steal? It's a heart issue. Yes, we know these things are against the law. Yes, he tell us that we shouldn't do these things. Well, like he told us that we shouldn't divorce either, but he gave you a certificate so you can do it. It's in the Bible. He says that too. So we serve a God who's merciful and he's graceful. And he said, look, even if you did make this decision, there are some consequences with this decision. However, my grace is still sufficient. And no, none of them died for you. I did, and I make that decision. So you don't, I don't stand in judgment of anybody here for any decision you made. Because if the truth of the matter is, if the curtain was put off my life, you're going to look at some decisions and say, you, you did that. Or you thought about that. Or you put yourself in that situation. How dumb were you? So none of us have the opportunity to legislate that. Because see, Here's the thing is, you know, people ask, why do we have such a drug problem? Well, you don't have a drug problem if you don't have drug users. It's always kind of been simple to me. But we have a drug problem because we got drug users. You want to put drug dealers out of business? Stop using them. Well, why are they using them? i tell you why. It's their escape from reality. I'm dealing with this. I don't know how to deal with it. So instead of coming to the foot of the throne and putting it on Christ who cares for you, I choose Oxycontin. I choose drugs and alcohol. I choose marijuana. Whatever the case may be so I can get my mind off of it. And here's the thing. You forgot about it mentally, but the situation hasn't changed. What are you going to do? You're standing in the middle. You're standing in the middle. You use the drugs, the alcohol, the illicit sex, whatever it is that you do. You do that because you're in the middle. You don't want to make a decision. And so when you get done with all that, when the high is over, when that thrill is over, whatever the case is, where do you find yourself at? Still in the middle. I haven't seen anybody's problem or situation be solved because they did that. Name it. I still, I'm waiting. Think about it. Even those God have delivered from it. Think about when you did that. What did he do? It didn't change the situation. In fact, sometimes it made it worse. Because while you were in that alternate state or under that influence, other demon activity came in and you did something crazy. You decided you wanted to drive a car. You decided you wanted to play with a gun. You decided that you're going to go over there and, and say something you probably shouldn't say that you would have never said in your right mind. I know we used to say that in school, that's the alcohol talking. Because this dude about to get dropped. Y'all know, y'all seen those kind of things around people when they get a little inebriated. My family, you know, they do their thing. And they say, sometimes they say things I know they would never say if they were a sober mind. Or they would never do. But that influence opens up what? Other influences. And what happens is what? Now you're in a state that you that you wouldn't be in, that you, 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 don't, you normally would be fighting. This is why God tells us not to do these things. It's not because he don't want you to enjoy life. He's trying to protect you from you. Think about it. Why are you telling you not to have sex before marriage? Because what if that person is not the person you marry? Now you've already changed spirits with this person, bodily fluids and everything else. And now you got this person with you the rest of your life. You do. I don't care how long you've been married. It don't go away. You, you remember. You remember what you did. You remember how it went down. You remember how you got yourself in the situation. Has God forgiven you? Yes. But have you forgotten? No. Now, think about it. Take yourself back real quick. What if I never made that decision? What happens? I don't ever have that memory. You see how God's trying to save us all the time? And, no, and so we have to get to that point of accountability that we get to the point that we understand now. You know, as I got older, I understand, okay, God, I don't like this, but I get it now. I don't like eating all my vegetables, but I get it now. So I try to make up for that time as much as I can, right? 
I'm going to eat as many as I can now because I didn't eat as many as I probably should when I was 13. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I didn't drink as many water, as much water as I probably should have drank. But I get it now. So when you come to that level of understanding what you do, then you run towards it. You know, there are people who made the decision, no, I was sexual active, but now I'm celibate, so I get it now. God bless you. Because we all got our age and it's, it clicks. Some of us is earlier than others. I don't know about you. How many of you remember that day it clicked? I know I do. I was like, it just like it came out the blue. I was like, I should not be doing this. And for some, it's a progression. I mean, for me in high school, it started out everybody was cussing. Because when I went to middle school, that's what the thing was to do, cuss. That made you bad. Then I got to high school, like, I read something one time and said, people who curse, curse because they can't say what they really want to say. So therefore, they use it. It's a filler word. And it's actually dumb. And I thought about it. And from that day forward, I was like, nope, because I'm not dumb. That was me. I just talking about me. So every time I felt myself there, oh, Jiminy Cricket, so uh, I just made up all kinds of other stuff, right? But it's a progression. There was a decision made, and as I made that decision, that decision led to other decisions. And then I found ways to protect myself when things came. Oh, you want some of this? No, man, you know, I'm an athlete. I think that it's going to affect my performance. It definitely affected theirs. I was on the team with them. <laughs> He's like, well, y'all couldn't hit a shot tonight? Yep, because I'm thinking that they, yep, they got high before we started. Now, I want the best player on my team. I might have been like number 13 or 14. So I guess the worse they played, the more I got to play that night. So I just kind of like let it go, you know. But, but these are things you learn over time. So I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to help you, though. Know, we got to get out in the middle. Your family's lives depend on you making those right decisions. My children's lives depend on daddy getting it right. And that's pressure, yes. But I got God. I got my church family. I got those brothers and sisters saying, hey, look, we got a major decision in our life. And I can't give you all the details. And, you know, because I don't want you in my business, but I, I do need your help. So I'm going to ask you, can you pray for me? And just know that God got it under control. Sometimes it's okay to do that. I get it. Then there comes a time that, look, I just got to tell you, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. I'm trusting that you're not going to say anything, but I need you to help me because I'm weak right now. And the Bible tells us what? That the stronger are to what? To bear the infirmities of the weak. Because I'm strong right now, don't mean I might be strong the next week. Because life has a way of turning things on us. And we need each other. Are y'all hearing me this morning, church? So in the middle, God has brought you from a mighty long ways. Many of you, you could write a book about your life to this point, this far, and all the things you've been through and some of the great decisions you made and some of the poor ones you made. But I'm asking you today, what are you doing going forward? Paul said that, He's going to be here because he needs to help these young babies. He needs to help them work to maturity. He needs to help lead and guide them into truth and understanding so that what they might have what a joyous life. Paul said his life has already been joyous. He's already done these things, but he says this, and he ends in 26. He said that your rejoicing may be what? Abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He said, so by me coming to you again, I'm going to give you some information that's going to save your life. I'm going to give you some information that's going to help you make a different decision. Because information is power. In closing, I find myself oftentimes, you know, my wife and I, we look at things that we've done maybe financially or we've done in our marriage. And now we go back and we look and we have a conversation about it and say, you know what? If I would have known, how many of you say that to yourself? If I'd have known what I know now, I would have done this this way. You know, we, we had a house. My wife and I first moved to the Triad. We had a little house in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our first home we bought together. I think we weren't even married three months. Man told us we can get a house. Bush was handing them houses out. We was in line. And we got one. Brand spanking new. We loved that place. And then I got this job to come to Winston. 
And it was like, you know, what are we going to do? So we split between time there for the first maybe a year or two. Long story short, we paid like $100,000 for that house. Brand spanking new. And I was just messing around the other day, and I was just looking. And that house is worth almost $250,000 now. We was in a prime spot. We didn't know at the time. We was in North Raleigh. That's where everybody want to be now. Uh, I remember we did have the the um, the Olympic sprinter, Justin Gatlin, stayed in our neighborhood. I used to see him from time to time when he was running because he had a little Porsche. And I'm like, nice car is that? So we were fine that in time, and somebody rolling some chairs or something down the hallway, that we look at these decisions in hindsight and say, what could I have done different? And we pass this information on to the next generations if they'll listen. Because what I know now, what was a burden then, it seemed like, ooh, $650 a month. That's what we was paying. I would gladly pay that now because people pay that for cars. It's like, what if we could have held that, Felicia? <laughs> what if we would have rented that out? Because I know now they rent for like $2,000 a month. Easy. It was a townhome, no maintenance. Well built. Everything. And so it's our lives in Christianity. What if I would have gotten saved earlier? What if I would have trusted God on this? What if I would have stepped out on faith on this? And what I decided a long ago, that I was not going to live life with a bunch of regrets. This is why you see the Safe House Church. We're going on seven years. And I know some say, well, you're here, you're there. I, well, I know some who are 14 years, and they're smaller than this. And what I understand is not the uh, quantity of people, it's the quality of people. And I know we have great quality people here. And I'm grateful to be able to lead this group of quality people. And as God continue to add the other quality people here, and he's going to add more. I took a risk. I said, well, UNC system has been pretty good to me. I don't know Alabama from a can of paint. But what if I don't go? Definitely nothing's going to change. What if I did go and it worked out? So this is this thing of what? Faith. The Bible said what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, yet the evidence of things unseen. So you must start with hope, and it must be applied, and watch God continually work it out. I always think about faith like this, and I'm really going to close the eye. You know, I said, I've been saved since I was 15, but I, I did just watch my share of MTV back in and I was, you know, and I grew to like Michael Jackson. He wasn't my favorite in the beginning, but I grew to like Michael Jackson, right? And so, you know, he had this one song called uh, Billy Jean. And if you ever watch that music video, it has all this little sidewalk, right? And he's walking, and as he walks, what happens? The sidewalk lights up, and he knows what step to take next. He don't know how far to go down the road, but every step he take, another one lights up. And that's how, this is, I just mean, maybe it helps somebody, but that's how I, I see faith in my mind. I took this step. <sighs> Hope another one won't light up. <laughs> then all of a sudden, beep, I find myself here. Okay, are we going to be here for a while? Is this going to work out or is this the end? Oh, okay. And you keep making that track along the way. Because there's some other ones that I've seen little game shows where they're like, you got to pick which one. That's what we do when we don't have to, when we ain't walking by faith. You pick which one and now you're getting lucky. Okay. Whoa! Now when they fall right through the wall, right? And that's what happens when we don't walk in faith. We, we, we out there, we're guessing. See, so that's the difference. When you're in faith, you know. You just got to wait until he tell you. See the difference? Versus when we play on the game shows and they're trying to pick which one to walk in, and you hit the wrong one, what happens? They fall in the hole, they fall through the thing, or whatever the case may be. And that's the difference. You and I are not guests. They're guests. And some of them are lucky. They get it right. The Bible says it in Ecclesiastes that what? It's a game of chance. <laughs> and life is just I mean, it's a game of chance, right? And so what I found is that those who are outside of Christ, 
are living on a game of chance. It works out for some, it doesn't work out for others. But you and I who are in Christ, there is no chance. There's uncertainty, and it's dependent on our what? Obedience. This is why he says obedience is better than sacrifice. Because if you are obedient and you do what I tell you you got to do, sacrifice is not required. So that's what I'm going to sacrifice. If you obey, you ain't got to sacrifice. Because sacrifice is what? To make up for disobedience. Think about it. I said I was going to stop, but it's getting good to me now. He's saying that the animals, right? They had them animals, the bullocks and the doves. They sacrificed them for what? Sin. What is sin? If you look up sin, sin means simply one thing, to miss the mark. It came from the Greek word sin. They shoot an arrow, and the arrow was sin. Meaning that the arrow did not hit its target. We have a target for our lives. And sometimes we miss that target. And when we miss that target, there's a consequence for missing the target. Something has to die. And instead of it being you and I, Christ already did that for us. And therefore, we don't die immediately. So if we fall in obedience, there's no chance. And I have to fight this daily. You have to fight this daily because what? Everybody else is living on chance. Because I sit there and I'm, guilt, I'm so guilty of it. I am. It's like, I'm one of these ones. I read a lot of autobiographies. And I'm trying to see how people got what they got. I'm trying to you know, get down that with And I see they did this. And he did this. And he did this. And I thought myself, okay, cool. He showed me the map. He did this. He did it. Then I just stuck. But he did that. But I can't do that because that's contrary to your word. So I do now. So now I find myself in the middle. Do I do something contrary to God's word because it's going to give me the position? I know it works because it worked for them. But what did they give up to do? We see this exposure all day. And this year, 24, is going to be exposure. Y'all see people just get exposed to stuff they have to do to get what they got? All day long. And the year's not even over. So now I find myself in this position. Well, Lord, I screwed up. Because I was following Johnny Cochran stuff. So I'm here now. So Lord, I need you to step in. And he's like, okay. <laughs> then I go here, here, and I end up in the same place they have without the same sacrifice that they had to give. Because I was obedient. It got me in that position. And what I'm finding is sometimes it takes a little longer. It takes a little bit longer sometimes. Why? Because that one who went that way, I gotta wait for them to clear. Ooh. I'm learning. It's not easy though, because you gotta be patient. That's why he said, what? Patience is working through what? Through trials. It's a trial to sit there and see somebody you know who got ill gotten game be successful. You know what they did. You know who they put under the bus. You know what they stole from. You know who they sat with. You know all of it. And you sit there with your mouth shut. And the Bible said what? It seemed like they're going to win. And they are winning for what? A time. But when that time is up, they're done. And here you go. You've been over there. Whoop, 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 whoop. And they get out there like Pharaoh was with Joseph. Whew. You're in a bad situation here. Who's your help? And there's that guy. I know a man in prison who interpreted my dreams and he told me that I'm going to be right here where I'm at. Pharaoh said, go find that man. And see if he can interpret my dreams. He interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, tell them what's going on. Pharaoh said, do what I'm going to do. I'm making you take that charge. Nobody, you won't answer to me. It wasn't about the positioning that he was in, but God put him in a position what? Because he had to make a decision several times, and that decision was what? Not to save himself, but he ended up saving his people. And that's what I want to get you all to see. That yes, in the middle is God is going to do some things for us, but everybody in here is responsible, at least for somebody else. And because Joseph made that decision, he saved 72 people. That was his family. They came from out of exile. They came back to Egypt to live. And those 72 turned into what? When the Bible said they left, they were many. 72 people. One man, one decision. 
He could have chose. He could have slept with Potiphar's wife. Because that's what the world would have did. But his faith system said, no, bro, you, you can't live like that. And it cost him, as it seemed. But God had what? A plan. So I just want to leave you encouraged today that no matter what you're going through, we all going through something. We all got something we're dealing with. But I want to encourage you, keep living holy. Keep living right. I know it seems like they're winning, and they probably are winning for a season. But God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And if you sow it in the flesh, and you'll reap it in the flesh. And no, we don't celebrate their downfall. We just use it as a cautionary tale, as a reminder. When you, the Bible says like this, he said, Yea, do I walk through the shallow of the valley of death. I shall fear no evil. The rod and staff is there to comfort me. Why? It's the shadow of death. What's in there? Bodies. And these are the bodies that you pass along the way. And you got that staff to clear them out the way for you. He didn't say you won't go see them. That's the part that gets you. Because you think, is that going to me? Is this going to work out for me? It didn't work out for them. There are some people, and I look at some of the professions and things I do, I do kind of put them on a the pedestal. I'm like, man, they're great at this, 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 and that. And then you see them fall. And then you get there, and you see that body right there. Man, they didn't make it. How am I going to make it? Because you built it. You got God. They played a game of chance, and they lost. Because at some point, the game of chance, you lose. That's how it works out. But with God, we gain. And this is how we win. And we will continue to win. And as they say, all we do is win no matter what. That's what no matter what. Because God did. And I'm going to walk through that valley. You walk through that valley. You'll see some people that started the journey with you. And you all just going to keep You'll keep going. You'll keep passing. Yeah, they'll shoot up like this initially. Then they'll level off. And you'll just keep doing like this. And you'll see them along the way. You treat them nice. You treat them kind. You treat them with love. And you keep moving. And you're going to look back over your life and say, my God, how good you've been to me. God bless you all. I love you all. If there are any prayer requests at this time, we want to provide any prayer. Hallelujah. And we just thank God for this word that he's given on today. I ask that you stand. Let us pray.